Hi folks, Dave here at Thunder Mesa Studio, where it's time for me to jump back in to another big structure build. And this time, it's the Big Thunder Mine itself. The whole reason the railroad's here in the first place. I'm starting with a Wild West Scale Models kit that I'm going to be doing a lot of modifications to, including adding lights and some animation. The hoist house sits directly above Rainbow Caverns. And the plan is to have an animated hoist, so you'll see the cage going down through a shaft here, right through the caverns, disappearing down below the fascia for a moment, pausing, and then coming back up again. I've already done a little bit of preparation on the site by cutting a mine shaft right straight through the foam and into rainbow caverns. This mine is also the location where ore is loaded onto the ON18 Horse Thief and Nevermind, so there'll be an ore bin out front as well. I actually started on this structure a little while ago, so let's uh, take it over to the workbench so we can back up a few steps and see where we're at. Well, none of this has been glued together yet, so I think I can just pop it off the base. Yeah, the first modification I've done to the kit is uh, to create this uh, base out of some quarter-inch thick MDF. It comes with this uh, nice uh, laser-cut wooden floor, but the base is something I added. I uh, took some quarter inch MDF and then used a Dremel tool to uh, carve it, make it look like stone. And then I painted it with acrylics to uh, match the stonework on the rest of the layout. I think the first thing I want to do now is pop these walls apart. That's a really nice fit with those uh, laser cut pieces, by the way. And do a little finish work on these. When I first started this build, I hand painted this uh, graphic on the side and I'll be honest I'm not really thrilled with the way it turned out so I'm going to sand it off and uh, start again. I think this is really clever right here the way these walls fit together and uh, kudos to the designer of the kit for coming up with this solution. Look at that. <laughs> and that's because you can't usually get big pieces of basswood like this uh, to uh, to laser cut, they're just they're not made that wide. So you have to come up with some clever solutions sometimes, and that's a good one. I'm also not real satisfied with this uh, stain color that I originally used. I, I want it to be I want the building a little to be a little darker, so it stands out against the skyline a little bit better. And the one I'm really thinking of is the. Um, the Big Thunder Mine <laughs> prototype at Disneyland Paris. And it's kind of this dark weathered brown. So that's kind of the color I want. Um, so right now I'm just adding a little bit of a little bit more distress to the boards with a razor saw. And then I go back with a hobby knife and put in some knot holes here and there. Which you can do just by twisting it. Now I'm going to use my shoe dye wood stains and if you watched my video on staining wood you saw how I make this stuff. Basically you empty out all of the shoe dye and then fill the bottle up with uh, rubbing alcohol, mix it all and then it mixes with the residue of the dye that's in there and makes a nice uh, thin sort of uh, um, stain wash. So I'm going to mix some of this um, brown with about the same amount of black. Let's try it on this piece first. So the goal here is to uh, darken this up a shade and also to bring out that wood grain that I just added and the, the knot holes. What's cool on these uh, kind of laser cut walls is where they've got the, the cut board detail. You can come right up to the edge of it, use a smaller brush with your stain and really make a nice delineation there. Gives, gives a little variety. And the walls are going to be bored and batten when they're finished. So I've taken all of the battens and trim pieces from the kit poured my uh, stain into a larger container so I can just toss them all in there, get a nice coat of stain on them, 
I'm going to let them sit in here a minute so they'll get a little darker and then I'll start fishing them out. Uh, just get some stain on these uh, these basswood doors too. Well, while the stain is drying on that other stuff, I can go ahead and uh, assemble all of the door frames and the window parts. And those are made from some nice thin laser board and some laser etched, uh, looks like model airplane plywood. So I'll get all those uh, put together. Then I can get a coat of primer on those. And um, then I can put the whole, all the walls together in the flat. Put the doors and windows in and the battens and those will be ready to go set those aside and go on to the next sub-assembly. Well I've got a nice uh, coat of dark brown primer on uh, all of these door and window frames but I want to lighten them up just a little bit and give them a little age and wear and tear so I'm going to dry brush on some Apple Barrel Territorial Beige next. I want the uh, the trim pieces to be just, you know a shade of brown darker than the walls, but not quite this dark. So just uh, going along here with the stiff brush and hitting the high spots. I always try to put more highlight down here at the bottom of these frames where water would splash up from the ground and fade things out a little bit more and desaturate it. Now, John, just a little bit of a lighter shade. So I'm going to use some uh, Apple Barrel Khaki. Go back over very lightly. Just hit it here and there. The doors are basically a sandwich with some uh, basswood on one side and some thin model airplane plywood on the other side. Just like that. So I'm going to glue those up now. Put that together. And make sure this dries flat. Put a piece of chipboard and then a one, two, three block on top of that give it a minute to dry and I'll do that with all of these doors. Well I thought it would be well worth it to invest a little time and add some Z braces to the doors. Um, the kit doesn't come with these this is just some uh, O scale 2x4 that I have so I stained it up the same shade as the doors and I'm just adding some Z braces now. Um, measuring down about a foot, scale foot from the top and a scale foot from the bottom. And that's really all I got to do. I don't need to make the Z line across there because that'll be pretty apparent once I get the top and bottom braces on. Just take my 2 by 4 I don't, I don't cut it to size ahead of time. Just lay it right on top of there, come right up to the line. Kind of finger clamp it and you flip it over. Take your hobby knife and just trim it flush with the edge, just like that. And we can put the Z brace in. Just lay it over the top and mark the angles by eye. The Big Thunder Mine Building at Disneyland Paris has uh, dark brown trim, except for the windows. The windows are all uh, kind of an oxide red. So I've gone ahead and put a coat of red oxide on all of the window frames. And that should make a really nice looking assembly when it's all put together. But once again, before I put it together, I'm going to dry brush on some uh, a lighter shade. I think I'll use just some of this uh, khaki. Once again, this is just to give it a little bit of character and some age and 
to uh, highlight the details, the edges of the window mullions and things like that. Just really makes it pop. Don't want to overdo it though, because I don't want to lose that red oxide coloring. Just a little bit. Around the inside edge of the window frames, I think, is enough. The kit comes with some uh, nice laser cut uh, glazing, just some clear acetate. And I'm going to just leave it right in the backing sheet. Just put uh, some dabs of Eileen's in the corners. This is Eileen's Tacky Glue, which is my preferred glue for glazing windows. Take my glasses off so I can see onto the sheet. Just like that. Well, I got all the windows glazed, and uh, I have to say that that went about as smoothly as this kind of operation can ever go in a kit. And kudos to the makers of uh, Wild West scale models. Uh, nicely done. Now I want to put the, the double hung windows together, and I think I'm going to model most of them open. And I give you the option that uh, on these windows, uh, you can model them open or closed. This one I'm going to have open almost all the way. All right, let's do the rest of them. Well, now I can start... Uh, putting the walls together, putting the windows in, uh, putting the window frames on and the door frames. The doors I will wait. I'm not going to put those on until the structure is just about finished so I can decide which one I want to have positioned open or closed or whatever. But right now, I can start gluing the windows into the window frames. Nice tight fit, a little tighter than I want. So take a flat file and just open that up just a little bit and that drops in like so make sure that's flush with the edge I really like the different size windows. It adds a lot of character. And I assume that is uh, based on the prototype for this mine head frame, which stands in Rico, Colorado, right by the side of the highway, as a matter of fact. I've driven by it many times. Well, I've got the last of the door frames on, and now I am going ahead and starting on the battens. And admittedly, um, doing hand uh, applying battens is a is a time consuming and can be a tedious process. Um, but I, I really think it's worth it for the look of a building like this. They give you the option in the kit you can you can leave the battens off if you want to. I am choosing to put them on, and. Um, as far as a technique or anything like that, I'll just say that um, the uh, the best way that I've found to do it is, uh, you know, on real board and batten siding, the batten goes over, you know, it's halfway uh, overlaps one board and the next. But on a model, it's a lot easier to uh, come right up to the edge of that line, line your batten up that way and glue it on. Uh, because sometimes you, you, that way you'll have a consistent width of the boards. Because if you try to line it up, you know, halfway over one and halfway over the other, you're going to get a little bit of loosey-goosey in there, and it's, it's going to end up uh, not being as straight as you would like. So, putting on board and batten one at a time, and, um, you know, this is exactly the kind of procedure the time lapse was invented for. Before I add the uh, battens to this final wall, I wanted to make some modifications to it. What I want to do is add a, uh, a bump out up here 
on the second story, it kind of hangs out over this uh, this door, and this will also hang out over the canyon when it's in place over on the layout. Add a lot of visual interest and make the roof line a little bit more interesting and more similar to the uh, the Disneyland Paris uh, Big Thunder Mine building that I'm using as an inspiration. So I created this little mock-up and uh, then designed some pieces and cut them out on my laser. Just waiting for the stain to dry, and I'll put all that together. I also cut a doorway in what seemed like a likely place, and we can say this little bump out will be the mine office. I cut the pieces for the bump out out of some 1 16th of an inch thick basswood and did my best to stain it to match the rest of the structure. I think I'll start by assembling this corner right here using the same kind of tabs as the rest of the model has. Also using some 6x6 six six bracing on the inside and for the floor. So I've laser cut some uh, windows for, for the uh, bump out section and uh, out of the same kind of uh, 25 thou laser board. And I'm just using some of the leftover glazing that came with the kit, trimming that to size. Well, I didn't uh, laser cut any uh, um, casements for the windows. So I'm just building those up with some scale strip wood. Pretty easy, just takes a little time. When the glue dries, I'll get some weathering on these so they'll match the rest of the windows. Since this is supposed to be an office, presumably, um, it would probably have blinds in the windows. And I'm just going to model those with some uh, manila file folder paper that I've uh, colored with a dark green sharpie. Now, I think I can glue this whole assembly onto the main wall. Now I'm ready to put the rest of the battens on. Well now with the exterior walls finished and set aside, I can uh, get to work on some of the other sub-assemblies in the kit. And I just spent the last couple of hours um, cleaning up and then distressing and staining some parts for the, uh, the front of the head frame. Rather than just a bag of sticks, the uh, kit has some nice laser cut timbers out of some, um, what is this, a 3 16ths of an inch thick basswood. So it uh, allows you to have these lovely uh, half lap joints and mortise and tenon joinery. So the most time consuming part is really uh, getting the parts off the sheet, cleaning them up, 
and then distressing them and staining them. Putting them together should be a breeze. I'm going to start on the front of the head frame assembly. We've just got some nice mortise and tenon joinery here. Slide that in. Should be able to just slide this together. That's nice. Mortise and tenon goes like this. got this ore chute which is made out of some, uh, some birch plywood nice half lap joints very prototypical this is uh, just the way these uh, these things were put together oh so satisfying when you press that out down in there look at that very satisfying I love that the instructions say to use the base as a guide and that is a smart way to do it I think I can uh, glue these two sub assemblies together. So again, we'll use the floor. It's not bad. Well, now I've started working on the main head frame, the big one. And these pieces are cut out of some quarter inch thick basswood uh, to represent uh, 12 inch, big beefy 12 inch timbers. Once again, some really nice mortise and tenon joinery. Just a pleasure to put together. Just like that. Nice. Now the way this uh, this structure works is that the the head frame actually sticks out above the roof line quite a ways, uh, more than half of its height actually. Um, and how they've achieved that in the kit, they've done some very clever engineering on the roof. And that's what I'm putting together now. I've reached the point in the instructions where I am uh, to pass the legs of the head frame down through the roof panels before the walls are put together. Like I said, some interesting engineering. It's rather ingenious. So these uh, braces hold the the uh, shape of the roof. When the mine is finished, there'll be a little platform up here and some uh, ore car tracks that come out uh, to a tipple. But I wanted to add a second set of ore car tracks crisscrossing this way, going through there. And I'm using some uh, some Pico HON30 track which i use throughout the layout to represent uh, 18 inch gauge and then when this is in place this lower ore bend will feed these tracks down here now i'm just using some uh, some chalks to dirty things up a little bit 
around this track and around these mine shaft openings. I know there's going to be another door right back here, so add a lot of grime and dirt around this back door. That's pretty good. Now I can try and finagle this head frame through these roof panels. There we go. All right. Well, I got to tell you, that's one of those uh, <laughs> one of those procedures that when you see it on paper, you're like, "There's no way that's going to work," but uh, it actually works. This piece was stronger than I thought. As I said earlier, it's uh, very well engineered. Now I've got another brace to put in, which will basically lock this into place. Hmm. Pretty nifty. Well, that was pretty straightforward, but this next bit is, you know, one of those assemblies where everything has to go right <laughs> and it has to, a whole bunch of things have to happen at the same time. This head frame is going to go down into these slots in the floor here at the same time as these tabs in the wall go into these slots in the roof. That's the theory anyway. If you've ever tried to assemble something like this, you know what I'm up against. So, wish me luck. Let's see how it goes. Let's see how my juggling skills are. I apologize in advance for any cussing. Oh, get back there. Yeah. All right. All right. Now, for the front half of the equation, this is good too. There we go. Think so. Now I should be able to slide this wall right into place without too much difficulty. Oh man, I screwed up. I forgot to put the uh, the decking in before I put the front wall on, and now I can't get it in there. I have an idea. I'm gonna cut this here, I think. Right where the scribed boards board detail is, right where the boards come together. Cut all the way through. And then I can put this in here in a couple of pieces. Yeah. That'll work. Well, just one more wall to add. And that's the one I modified. I went back and removed the roof tabs from this. Um, the ones that go in these slots here. Because I would like for this wall to remain removable so that I can access the entire interior of the mine and add more details and lights and things at a future date. And in theory, I should be able to just slide it up in here. And that should slot into there. There we go. And then I'll have some trim pieces that'll hide these corners. Now I am ready to finish the roof on the Big Thunder Mine. This is always an exciting moment. And um, the kit comes with this nice uh, corrugated material. It's a thick silver paper, and it's cut into strips that are a scale 
looks like 30 inches wide. And though it's a nice silver color, it's going to look a little too new if I put it on like that. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, spray some uh, different colors on here. Mostly a gray primer, but uh, a couple other things too. So I'm going to set this up to paint and we'll uh, take a look at that. So the first step will be to get a coat of this uh, flat gray primer on here. And now I'll take some of this uh, red oxide primer and just kind of lightly mist over the top, just to add a hint of rust. Do it more heavy in some places than others. And the final step is to take some of this dark brown and do the same thing. Just kind of lightly mist it in a few areas, just to show some darker spots of rust. Okay, I'll let all that dry. Now with that base coat dry, I'm just using some um, apple barrel pewter gray and just lightly sponging it on. And this, uh, this will look like uh, unrusted bits of metal showing through. Make most of the paint off of the sponge before I go in. Just lightly tapping it. And this is just a regular old yellow kitchen sponge I'm using. I also have uh, you know, sea sponges that I like to use, but it's just whatever gives you the best pattern that you like. And now I want to add some dark rust spots, and I'm going to just use some apple barrel burnt umber. And these just very lightly go on. Now some of these will get a lot, and some will get very little, because these are going to be cut into like 8 to 10 foot lengths, and then mixed and matched to get a nice uh, variety on the roof. And now I've got some, uh, some burnt sienna and some red oxide. And I'm actually just kind of mixing them together on the sponge, a little bit like that. You don't have to do it this way. You could do one at a time, but I like the variation you get doing it like that. Now I'll just sponge that on. The last coloring step before I start uh, cutting these into panels, is to take some, um, got some orange chalk and some uh, uh, kind of uh, burnt sienna chalk. I'm just uh, brushing those powders on in random places. Obviously, the orange represents newer, fresher rust, and this is what really actually ties it all together and brings it all together. You can use different kinds of pigments for this. I know there are different manufacturers, Bragdon's powders, uh, MIG. Uh, so there are different uh, products you can use. I just happen to have a lot of artist chalks, so <laughs> I use that. Works for me. And I just uh, got a piece of sandpaper, use that to scrape the uh, the powders off and use a brush that I don't use for anything else because dipping it in the sandpaper eventually wears the brush away. And the nice thing that the chalks do, uh, as far as rusting corrugated iron is concerned, is it gets it down in between the corrugations, which is where the rust is actually most likely to occur. If you take away one thing <laughs> from any of this, it's all about the variety. It's all about the subtle variations of shade. There's no just one rust color. You know, you, you've got to have subtle variations. The darker browns, the siennas, the lighter oranges, all of it works together. Now I'll get a coat of fix on all this and we'll start cutting it into uh, properly sized lengths to put on the roof. So I'm using Eileen's uh, tacky glue to put these sheets on. The uh, instructions recommend either uh, either Eileen's or uh, double stick tape, and you know I'm not a big fan of double stick tape for this kind of thing because tape is acidic and it will discolor parts over time and eventually uh, completely lose its stickiness, and your shingles will your shingles or your 
corrugated iron roofing will just fall off. And you don't have to completely slather the entire back with glue, just a little bit near the corners, maybe a dab or two in the middle. That's actually better because if you if you put glue over the whole thing, it's more li- they're more likely to curl up. So you can already see the variation that's uh, been baked in on these uh, corrugated panels. But down in this corner, it meets this little hip roof here. I need to trim off that angle. Now, when doing uh, corrugated iron and you get to the crest of the roof like this. Um, one thing I would caution you against doing is taking a full sheet and bending it over the top. It might be tempting to do that. In fact, it actually shows that in the instructions. And I won't say uh, <laughs> that it never happens, uh, but I will say that I've never seen it uh, in prototype practice on a structure like this in an old mine building or warehouse or whatever you're doing. I've never seen that. And, and that's for the simple reason that corrugated iron would be extremely difficult to bend against the corrugations. What I do see is they'll take a strip like this and bend it with the corrugations and use that to cap the roof. So that's what I'm going to do here, like that. Now I'm putting together the uh, the sheaves that set up at the top of the head frame, and that's what the cables go through down into the mine for the lifts. And these are made with some uh, some 25 thou laser board, it looks like. And I just have to glue up the different pieces. There's some inner spokes, and then a couple of outer rings, and then a couple of bushings for each side. I get that centered on there. You know it's centered because then there's no, uh, you can't see the rim from the outside anywhere. And I just take a piece of scrap wood and clean out any glue blobs that might have squeezed through. If I did everything right, when it's dry, it should spin just like that. Now I just want to show you real quick how I uh, try to make... Uh, these pieces look like iron. I've painted them uh, that dark flat brown and now I'm just going to go back and dry brush on some highlights using some uh, apple barrel granite gray which is a very light gray. So to give it the look that uh, some of that grime and rust has been worn away exposing the raw metal underneath. These are the little uh, brackets or cleats that uh, hold the sheave wheels to the head frame and they're made of basswood in this kit and of course in real life they would be iron so we've got to make them look like iron too best we can now i just got done uh, gluing in the sheave braces it's just last piece Also wanted to show you an extra detail that I added that uh, was not included with the kit, and that is these uh, these uh, truss rods coming down. Just use some uh, brass wire and some nut bolt washer cast- castings up on the top to represent some uh, some trusses 
which you often see in structures like this, give some extra strength uh, to these uh, wood timbers. Yeah, get in there. There we go. All right. Now for the axles and the wheels. The axles are actually made from some round styrene, which I think is an interesting choice. Most people would have used uh, brass wire, I would think, but I don't see why it shouldn't work. There we go. And I'll touch this up so you won't be able to see that glue. Love it when a plan comes together. Another little detail I want to add is a small platform up here by the sheave wheels, top of the head frame, because there would likely be one there. These things have to be maintained and oiled, freed up if they if they bind. So someone's got to climb up there and do that. So you need a little catwalk. That's what I'm adding right there. Coming out the front of the mine here will be a, a, a ON18 you know, track going to a, an ore bin, the main ore bin. Um, and it's, it's really nicely engineered. Uh, you got some laser cut ties and uh, um, trestle bents and all that. I just want to dress it up a little bit, uh, particularly these bents. Usually anytime on a laser cut part, um, where there's, uh, you know, the grain is going the wrong way <laughs> on the part. I mean, it's fine for these uprights, but the grain would not be going this way uh, on those pieces in real life. I want to dress that up or at least hide it a little bit. So I've got some um, some four by eights that I'm going to glue across the top like that. And then I'm going to add some, it comes with uh, some suede, suede braces, but I'm going to add a couple more because this is just kind of hanging out here uh, off the end of the, of the model. And I'm going to be moving around a lot. So I'm going to add some diagonals here. And I'm going to replace these uh, laser cut bridge ties with just some, um, some four by sixes that I've uh, uh, cut to length and stained. It'll just look better, I think. The kit uh, doesn't actually come with any rail, but this is some code 70 that I had in my stocks so I'm going to use that with a mining cart track this is a non-operable track obviously so I don't have to worry too much about keeping it clean or anything I can weather the heck out of it I painted it a kind of a rusty red color now I'm going to glue it in here. In fact, I really don't even have to worry about keeping it perfectly engaged. You know, it just has to look right. You know what I mean? I just cut a little block here to keep it more or less engaged as I line it up on these scribe lines. Now even the uh, tiniest rail spikes are a little big for this kind of track, what I should say is they're too long. And they go all the way through the ties and out the bottom. I'm cutting a little bit of them off. And then I've got to drill a little pilot hole and put them in that way. It takes a little time, but I think the final look will be worth it. And now, once again, I get to dirty everything up with some chalks. The kit uh, comes with some uh, some catwalk planks uh, for this uh, trestle track, but um, I'm going to substitute some old, worn out <laughs> coffee stir sticks. Give it a little more character. Got to have a walkway here, of course, because this is a human powered railway. Well, kind of in the home stretch now. 
We'll be putting the final trim pieces on soon. A couple more little details on the interior. Um, but looking at this side, especially looking at it up on the layout, this side seems a little plain to me. And I know it's prototypical, but this is supposed to be the big thunder mine. Um, so it should have a very interesting roof line, which it does. But I want to add uh, one more little thing, a little awning right over this door right here. I have just enough of the corrugated material left <laughs> to, uh, to roof it. So I'm going to cut some uh, braces. And I'm going to put a little awning over this uh, this roof here, just to add a little bit more visual interest to this side of the building. The brackets I'm making couldn't be much simpler. Everything's cut on uh, 45 degree angles to make it easy. It's just a three-piece bracket. Just goes up like that. Just need to make another one of those. I also want to add some uh, extra detail uh, to the head frame. These little guys are some, uh, they're actually some narrow gauge boxcar parts uh, from Grantline that I had in my scrap box, but they also make excellent looking uh, iron plates that you would see to reinforce these, uh, these uh, joints right here. So. Glue these up on each side of that joint. Just one more important detail to add. sign. And this I made from, uh, did the uh, the graphics in Adobe Photoshop, used some CG wood textures. I need to go over one more. Just printed textures and uh, I glue it up on here. One of the the best details that you can add to a mine head frame like this, in my opinion, is a ladder. Uh, there should be a ladder uh, somewhere here uh, so workers can get up here and access these sheave wheels and the other hardware up at the top of the head frame should anything break down. Um, so I created a, a template. And this is going to be about a 25 foot ladder. Now all I have to do is glue in the rungs about every 12 inches apart. Now for extra credit you can go back with a dress pin like this and put some nail holes for each one of the rungs. All right now I should be able to just cement this to this upright. Make sure it's straight. I decided I also wanted to dress up the edge of the roof here a little bit. So I'm adding some, uh, this is some O scale 2x6 trim. Now the stain on these, uh, some of these 2x6 trim pieces dried a a shade lighter, shade or two lighter than I, I want it to be. So I'm just going to go back with, this is watercolor, some burnt sienna mixed with some cobalt blue. I want it to be kind of a, a nice brown uh, to match the framing on the windows and the doors. While we're over on this side, I'll point out a couple of the other details I added. This is a cow skull. It's a white metal casting from uh, Wiseman Model Services. 
just a little something I couldn't resist. And uh, then I've got a smoke jack over here too. This is from Titchy because I figured they would have a, uh, a stove up in the up in the office. And since the watercolor is transparent, uh, it acts much more like a stain on the strip wood than, uh, say, acrylic paint wood, which would just kind of sit up on the top. This uh, soaks in. And while we're still over on this side, I want to add another sign up here to the, uh, to the roof of the office. Uh, and once again, this was uh, created in Adobe Photoshop. I even used the same font uh, that's used at the parks. It's called Big Thunder. You can you could purchase it online if you'd like. Um, and I printed this out on my home inkjet printer and laminated it to some Bristol board, which I painted dark brown on the back. And you use a Super 77 spray adhesive on the back and then lay it down and roll it out and get all the air bubbles out. Now I'm going to uh, cut it out and trim it, and we'll put it up on the building. And with that, I do believe the shaft house is done, except for one small little detail. I, uh, I had the artwork for the Big Thunder Mountain medallions, the, uh, the uh, monogram, and I thought it would be really cool to laser cut a couple and uh, paint them up to look like they were made out of iron and uh, put them on a building here. All right, now it's done. And I think that's going to wrap it up for the Shaft House or the Big Thunder Mine. I want to give a sincere thanks to the folks over at Wild West Scale Models for creating such a beautiful kit that was such a joy to build and so much fun to play around with, too. Now, I can hear some of you folks out there saying, well, Dave, what about the ore bins? And uh, what about the interior lighting and animated hoist and figures and details and retaining walls and all that good stuff? Well, my friends, I'm afraid all of that good stuff is going to have to wait for future installments in the Big Thunder Mine series. There'll be two, maybe three chapters, maybe four. We'll see how it works out. Until then, thanks for watching, everybody. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to see more. And remember, you can follow along all the projects over on my website. That's uh, thundermesa.studio. Or follow along on Instagram at thunder.mesa. Until next time. Keep moving forward, everybody, and adios for now.